Hello everybody, it's AJ the Mighty Glue Stick. Welcome back to the Monster Ecology Specialist channel. And uh, thank you very much for 2,500 subscribers, which I've now blasted past. Uh, that was a great birthday gift, thank you very much. And also thank you for the birthday uh, messages from everybody on Facebook. I do have a page on Facebook for the Mighty Glue Stick, so if you want to head over and uh, check that out. Sometimes I leave little sneak peeks of what I'm working on. Uh, but otherwise it's just uh, another place where you can catch my updates. Right, today I'm going to be covering Tieflings, another playable race. Yay! Uh, and uh, I really like Tieflings. I think they're a great uh, character to play as a player character uh, because of their sort of more difficult existence that they live it leaves a lot of room for you to develop a character that um, is slow to trust people and etc etc but i'll get into their personality later on so uh, as per usual i'm here to present you with a detailed outlook on the tiefling race and uh, also some stuff that you didn't know about tieflings and some uh, variants of tieflings that you could discuss with your dm or if you're running a game as a dm uh introduce to your players as possible player character variants of tieflings that are a lot of fun to play so i'm going to cover some of those and also a bit about the uh the history of the tiefling in dungeons and dragons right let's get started okay so in uh if we go to wikipedia um it'll give you some information on uh the basics of tieflings and their history in dungeons and dragons where they started who the first person to depict one was etc so they describe them as uh, a humanoid race originally introduced in the planescape campaign setting in the second edition of advanced dungeons and dragons they became one of the primary races available for player characters in the fourth edition of the game so this would be a relatively new addition to people who have started playing 5th edition who haven't played 4th edition. And that's something which kind of blows my mind because I, I, I am one of the people that played 4th edition. So tieflings to me are a part of the game. But I imagine for a lot of the people who are, have skipped from 3.5 or um, Pathfinder and are now playing 5th edition, tieflings would be like, whoa, where'd they come from? Uh, so let me just introduce you to this great race. They were... Uh, Originally introduced as humans with a demonic ancestry, whose lineage can be traced back to some degree or another to that of a fiend or a demon within the Dungeons and Dragons universe. That's actually not completely accurate. In 4th edition, they were very much a devilish, so a fiendish as in devilish, not demonic ancestry. Um, and in the 5th edition, if I flip to the book, it says that their infernal bloodline traces back to Asmodeus, overlord of the Nine Hells, and that they're basically... A previous generation uh, struck a deal, a pact, and Asmodeus's DNA was infused, or the essence of Asmodeus was infused into their bloodline, and that the tieflings that you play in the game are a result of that ancient sin. So they're the children's children's children who are still held accountable for that pact uh, and cannot escape it. It's part of their fate. So the tiefling is not exactly a typical crossbreed bloodline it is a curse it's a magical curse it's a magical template uh, that they carry within them uh, that they pass on to their offspring and uh, uh, it always breeds true um, so this is this is one of the un unsettling things that uh, the nine hells has sort of uh, taken upon itself to do uh, to extend its influence into the mortal realms it sets up this basically a tiefling race uh, that allows it to breed true so eventually if the tieflings were allowed to breed they would outbreed any population that they're in because their offspring would always be a tiefling so it's never really a you can't really be a half tiefling um, and they don't really produce if they breed with any other race they always produce a tiefling so this is this is a dangerous thing um, and this infernal bloodline uh, is derived from human bloodlines for the tiefling in the player's handbook However, let me tell you about some of the variants of tieflings. So in uh, Forgotten Realms, we have the Fairy, the Maeluth, the Tanaruk, and Whisplings, which are variants that you can play as um, another type of race with a fiendish um, background. Whisplings are descended from the breeding of halflings and demons. So they descended from demons and halflings. However, they lack the traditional fiendish traits, instead having light brown skin and red, uh, bright red hair. And despite their great abilities for stealth, they chose to commonly wear bright colors in order to stand out from the crowd. Um, and 
like most of the other plain touched ones they are they have dark vision um, out to 60 feet they also have the innate ability once a day to appear as any humanoid creature and that's about all the information that you have on them but it's an interesting variant where you could play a tiefling uh, halfling essentially um, and of course with that demonic um, background they are uh, chaotic in nature um, and probably evil so that's an interesting variant to play on a halfling as well Tanaruk are a crossbreed of orcs and demons and so they are very dangerous uh, they appear as short stocky orcs with bristly hair horns and ridges along the sides of their heads and they have distinctive brimstone smell about them and uh, they have the ability to naturally manipulate fire which is a common thread that you see through most artwork with uh, tiefling or demon touched races they originated as orc demon crossbreeds in the region around Hellsgate Keep um, in the uh, Outlands, I think that is. And however, years of dwelling in Faerun led them to be regarded as a separate species rather than as a subrace of orcs, uh, much like the tieflings are regarded as kind of a separate species of humans. They're nasty, brutish, not terribly intelligent, uh, but smarter than your average orc and extremely dangerous fighters unpredictable chaotic and very very destructive bloodthirsty so they will go to extreme lengths to win and destroy the target of their uh, their aggression uh, many become sorcerers and most of them become muscle for other fiendish creatures such as champions Maeluth are uh, essentially dwarven crossbreeds uh, with dwarves and devils so uh, the dwarves don't have a crossbreed variant with demons um, they're also regarded as outsiders native outsiders as well so they're extra planet creatures which are now native to the, the material realm and they're descended from fiends and dwarves that uh, have red eyes and no abnormally long fingers almost hairless bodies um, and they keep the, uh, the the natural dark vision of dwarves out to 60 feet they have better innate social skills than pure blood kin and commonly use them to attain positions of power so they're more charismatic and manipulative than your average dwarf and due to their diabolic heritage they are able to uh, cause melee weapons to gain unholy power so they can channel rage and uh, and evil through magical weapons that they can craft um, so yeah and they apart from the red eyes and long fingers and, and kind of hairlessness they don't have tails or horns or all that sort of thing uh fairy are demon fey so they're not a true elven subrace they're tiefling elves essentially and they're the result of interbreeding between sun elves and tanari in an attempt to strengthen the sun elf bloodline um back in back in the day um, they've got a more complex ecology um the generally rejected um any elven resemblance as offensive um, they've got barbed tails fangs forked tongues horns um, combinations of the two or three and some of them have multiple sets of arms or they can even have wings so they are much more fiendish looking than uh tiefling humans crossbreeds are um, so that's that's kind of unusual and unique to them um, those of them that are not visibly different to elves at all are raised amongst elves never knowing their true nature um, however it may manifest itself in the the proficiencies they have or their inclinations towards um, more rage and ruin uh, they have a talent for the use of magic and some would uh, practice blade song um, magical um, bardic abilities and they also uh, the ability to shape um, themselves to society so they're more even more charismatic and manipulative than your average elf and uh, they can also produce flames drain life from victims and have a natural spell resistance to them so they're good npcs as sorcerers rogues or fighters within elven or the outside of elven society kind of like uh, the dirty secret of the elven elven kind and they seek to establish um re-establish old elven realms in Cormanthe if you're in that in that region in your games um, yeah they consider their bloodline to be very important pride themselves on being able to trace back to the house of oh boy elven name Dlagdragith or the demon fey and this means that the typical um, they, they really only breed amongst themselves um, or exceptional elves so they seek to actually strengthen 
their bloodline and position um, or see themselves as dominant. It's that arrogance of the elves which is accentuated by their fiendish traits. And they generally look negatively upon um, outsiders um, but are respectful towards intelligence, strength, flexible morals, basically getting the job done no matter what. And uh, once they've made a friend, it's kind of like uh, they will not abandon that person immediately um, if it helped them. Um, uh, yeah. Otherwise, they'll just send, see others as uh, a mild annoyance, even as a friend. Um, yeah. So they've got an interesting history. And um, yeah, there's, there's, there's more story about those guys because elves uh, are very dramatic and lots of, lots of story related to them. So that's the, generally the, uh, the tiefling hybrids um, offshoots. Now, if we go to the Forgotten Realms tieflings, um, these again are uh, touched of the fiendish planes. Um, they're usually descended from fiends, but they also can be descended from demons, yugoloths, devils, evil deities, deities, and uh, other monstrous outsiders that bred with humans, such as succubi or incubi. Um, tieflings were known for their cunning and personal allure, which made them excellent deceivers as well as inspiring leaders, which uh, when uh, prejudices are laid aside. So if you accept them for them as an individual and not their origin, uh, they, they can take a warming to you. Although their evil ancestors could be many, many generations removed, the taint lingered. Um, unlike unlike half-fiends, who are a direct descendant, tieflings were not predisposed towards evil alignments and varied in alignment nearly as widely as full humans. However, their background as those who are raised within human society because there's generally not enough tieflings to make a tiefling society and if there were it's the prejudice would just stack up against them to the point where they would be uh basically driven to into um uh, the driven out of any any area as um the prejudices just cause people to well hate crimes basically so in this, um, you can see that they have more than one origin. So uh, in 4th edition, tieflings had a very very uh, stock look to them. So they had large brow ridge type horns on the top of their head, kind of like a water buffalo. They had long, fleshy uh, prehensile tails. Um, or Were they prehensile? I, I think they were just sort of moving around, but they couldn't use them as fingers or toes or anything. Um, and they had um, unusual skin tones, usually sort of reddish or purplish mauve color uh, and they they usually had alien unusual eyes now in your game because tieflings can actually have multiple outsider origins they can look quite variant from that and in fifth edition i see no reason why you would stick to just the the type of tiefling um, image that they have depicted here of this mauve skinned individual with kind of um, really quite unusual horns on the top of its head, kind of angular features and that big fleshy tail. Um, yeah, no reason why they would always look that alien, for instance, because they are born of mortal parents. I'm sure one of them is going to be a tiefling, but they may be born to a parent who didn't even realize that they carry a tiefling bloodline. They could have been orphaned. They could be uh, one of those rare tieflings that looks almost completely human. And... Uh, when they breed with somebody else, they could have effectively a monstrous child as far as they're concerned. And in the Dungeons and Dragons world, there is no reason why those parents would not go, ah, monster and kill the child. And that is the typical fate of most tieflings that they actually killed at birth. Uh, only the rare few uh, who, are re who are either raised by, say, a solo parent or um, essentially they're raised with the full knowledge that they are a tiefling or the possibility that they will be have this monstrous appearance um, those are the only ones who really make it and so there's this whole aspect of the manipulation or the the, the uh, prejudice towards them from birth and they're raised with expectations or fears about their origin and their nature that they have to deal with their entire life and it's kind of alluded to in uh, the the, the fluff text here we we're talking about um uh two tieflings who are talking to each other um and talking about the struggle um fighting against the the predispositions people have um their prejudices towards them and their predispositions so being greeted by stares and whispers suffer violence and insults on the street mistrust and fear in every eye 
that's the lot of every tiefling. And they can either rage against it and go the opposite extreme and go out of their way to be like the the Drisdurd and it is to drow. Some tieflings are paladins, uh, beacons of light. They uh, go to, out of their way to manipulate their appearance to look um, as good as possible, as, as least like devils as they can. So exotic, but not evil. Um, and that generally works for quite a few of them, but still there's always that initial shock of, oh, those aren't ornamental horns on your head. You actually have horns growing on your head. Even if you've covered them in, if you've painted them ivory white and covered them in filigree silver with gems and things, there's still horns growing from your head. They don't have contact lenses to cover up blood red eyes or black, completely black eyes. Um, they may file down their fangs, for instance, but still it's... A horrible process that they had to go to just to fit in with the rest of society and that feeling constantly of being an outsider not one of everyone else and not having a culture of your own however I like to think of tieflings in my games I usually um, have a kind of a unique culture to them uh, particularly in fourth edition as they have some abilities um, which sets them apart from others such as a resistance to fire um, having a resistance to fire damage in combat, that's great. But when you think about it as a day-to-day -day fact of life, imagine if you were resistant to fire. What would your house be like? Uh, would you be that worried about open flames and things? Would, would you set your thermostat to 50 degrees? Um, would you eat massively spicy food? These are the things which I introduce into the culture of individual tieflings in my game that stand out as much as their physical appearance does. So that uh, when you're in the house of an NPC tiefling, for instance, and you they hand you a bowl of broth, it's got ghost chili pepper in it. Um, it's extremely spicy and hot to the point where you're like choking and gasping. And they're like, oh, sorry, I forgot. You can't handle the heat. That sort of thing. I, I really love that. Or having... Um, other sort of fiendish aspects to them like a resistance to disease or poison which allow them to do distasteful things which normal humanoids wouldn't go anywhere near since for instance harvesting organs from long dead corpses bloated things disease and rot may not bother them they may be resistant to disease or just not have a sense of smell or taste um, as other people do they may favor foods and things which are outside of the normal human palate uh, so be able to eat bark and things like that or um, eat live creatures whole um, with a preference for that rather than cooking them, for instance, because they can actually taste suffering um, as a flavor. It's not because they're cruel. It's just that that's a part of their personality, their aspect, their physical traits that um, are very different from everyone else. And they have to struggle with reconciling the fact that they can taste suffering as a pleasurable thing. But they are now actually experiencing pleasure at the suffering of an animal. It's just something that exists for them and they have to deal with it. So they mature at the same rate of humans and live a few years longer on average if they do live to a full lifespan without being murdered or killed. Uh, their intelligence score increases by one and their charisma score increases by two. So this is a, a person who has a high intellect and a high charisma. They wear their, their feelings on their sleeve at most times and they deal with issues on day-to-day -day basis so they kind of like a tortured personality really um, their suffering lends them strength and uh, they have a lot of empathy for other people uh, mainly because they, they they try to get along they're, they're always trying to predict what other people are thinking about them constantly on their mind is their status in society and cleaving to people who they know they can trust who can they trust uh, one thing is that they don't generally trust each other. They don't trust other tieflings and they believe their own prejudice that the other people's prejudices against other tieflings are reflected also sadly, tragically, in their own nature. They don't trust tieflings because they know that some of the uh, the drives and inclinations that they constantly war against are, are, are struggles they, they quite often fail and they see those failures in other tieflings and are forewarned and forearmed about how weak tieflings can be and also how manipulative and deceptive tieflings can be so they're always ready to be double crossed by another tiefling and so it's very hard for them to form close personal bonds with other tieflings however when they do 
they are very strong bonds indeed. Um, and you will see occasionally tieflings who are a mated pair who will, who will kill for each other. Um, and essentially they've found a partner in life who understands their struggle and it's them against everyone else. So they lend each other strength that way. They have an infernal legacy that allows them to know the Thaumaturgy cantrip once they reach third level and they can cast Hellish Rebuke once per day as a second level spell. Once they reach fifth level, they can also cast the Darkness spell once per day and Charisma is their uh, base ability for casting these spells. So they may also have, well they probably will, be inspired to uh, cross class as other spell casting types as well because they have a natural inclination towards the arcane arts. Thaumaturgy, however, is a divine type spell, and that's the ability to manipulate your environment. They can uh, cause flames to change color, they can cause noises, um, they can cause the rooms to shake, they can make their appearance different slightly, um, more more impressive or otherwise. So uh, yeah, it's it's that's a huge aspect of their personality as well, and as a player, using thaumaturgy and all sorts of different minor ways to tweak the situation um, not to to be disruptive of the game or anything but just to emphasize the fact that your character is alien um, and has powers beyond the normal ken of mortal man um, that they they may use to great effect so their eyes may lick with flame or their hair may waft in an invisible breeze um, their, their cloak may billow out um, around them when they're, they're threatening or posturing. Uh, their swords may gleam with a glint of reflected fire that is not actually there. Uh, their shadow may move independently of them, that sort of thing, all at their own discretion. Um, but it's that ability to just manipulate slightly with minor illusionary effect or physical effect um, that speaks to them having an arcane control over their environment, which is freaky to the average person. Uh, they can speak and read uh, and write common and infernal. So that's also interesting. Is it an innate ability? Uh, do they pick it up because they're, they're driven to, to read it or learn infernal language? It's certainly not a commonplace thing that would be lying around. So do they seek it out or is it a natural aspect of their character, like a genetic memory, that uh, they can understand and speak infernal? Does it come with a set of memories or impressions of an infernal realm that they've never actually visited but with that comes a with the language comes an understanding of the infernal uh, order of things of the universe do they have an understanding of how diabolism works or summoning or circles or that sort of thing uh their that 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 really speaks a lot to their personality as well so you you can delve deeply into their character uh, so their alignment is they have a tendency towards evil um, and that's really what gets everybody else you know it is it is fairly um, stereotypical that tieflings do turn to evil um, and that certainly runs in their bloodline but it's not you know guaranteed um, and there are some famous tiefling paladins and clerics and wizards and things who do nothing but good obsessively even to the point of annoyance um, and of course that can also turn itself to evil as well. So a paladin or a fighter could become a blackguard um, through their rejection of a god's failings and reliant on their own power and will over anything else. So justice becomes persecution. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, they have uh, dark vision out to 60 feet as per usual. Base speed is 30 feet. Um, and yeah. So they're self-reliant. Um, they, it really depends on your background that you choose in the in the game, um, and I suggest that you do put some thought into your character's background, um, not to the pay, point of like making a twenty-page background that your your poor dungeon master has to pour over, um, unless he's asked for it or she has asked for it. But certainly have a look at the backgrounds, uh, possibilities, the trinkets, and things like that, and craft an interesting. Um, unusual story for your, your tieflings background because they've had an interesting life I guarantee you they've had an interesting life tieflings of course you're not restricted to having a tiefling looking very outlandish they could actually look quite normal they may not have horns they could have uh, spines on their skin they could have scales they could have um, a, a slightly more subdued cat like tail they could have some barbs on their tail uh, they could just have black clawed fingers like a goblinoid and fangs. 
um, and dark eyes, but manifest no other um, outward appearances of a devilish ancestry. And of course, if they're descended from Rakshasas or Grast or uh, Demogorgon or various others, they could have very variant traits. So someone who is descended from Grast could have an extra finger in their hand, dark skin, but otherwise appear quite normal. Uh, those who are descended from Rakshasas could have backwards facing hands. Uh, they could have a cat like tail. They could have tiger stripes on their skin as a pattern. That sort of thing. So really go to town um, and come up with interesting stuff about your tiefling. In, uh, in the history of the tieflings, uh, they, they first appeared, uh, the, the first artist to depict ones was uh, Tony, Tony uh, Dietelizzi, if I pronounced that correctly. And they first appeared back in 1994 in the Camp Planescape uh, setting. But they've kind of been present ever since in all the various editions. Second edition, third edition, which is where you, uh, you saw the Teferi and uh, various others. Um, 3.5, where they, you had the tier, Tiefling Paragon introduced in Unearthed Arcana in 2004. Um, and yeah, they've always been part of the Races of Destiny, Planner Handbook, the Plain Touched entry. Um, in fourth edition, of course, they became sort of mainstream, and um, yeah, they had a racial book um, dedicated to the, them in that edition, uh, Player Handbook Races Tieflings. So yeah, big time. And there's variant Tiefling builds appearing in the Sword Coast Adventure Guide, um, published in 2015, if you want to check those out as well. Um, I don't actually have that, so I'd be interested if uh, anybody's got any comments on that. And the fictional history, in 4th edition, they had their own history in, uh, in the game. Um, so the Tieflings trace their origins to ancient human empire called Baal Tarath. Uh, in the empire, the noble class was completely obsessed with preserving and gaining power. So they, were, they personified um, evil human intrigue and backbiting taken to the extreme where any, any um, means to gaining power was seen as okay. And they turned to fiendish, fiendish influence. Rumors of the schemes and obsessions with power reached a realm called the Nine Hells, where uh, the devils residing there gave the ruling classes of Beltarath visions while they slept, containing the directions for a grisly month long ritual that would extend their rule to eternity. The details of the ritual have been left unclear in the books of the Player's Handbook series describing the events though it's been described as being very horrible indeed so we're talking like baby eating that sort of thing as the ritual descended uh, demanded the participation of every noble house those that refused were slaughtered uh, once this horrible thing was done the ruling class begin uh, began their ritual and afterwards devils from the nine hells began to appear so basically they got an open invitation to the city. Uh, so essentially it became a demi-plane of the Nine Hells. And the nobles gladly made pacts with them willy-nilly. These pacts gave power to the nobles and their descendants forever. So these innate magical abilities of the tieflings are fueled directly from uh, fiendish influence. And if you want to take that as a, an aspect of your D&D world... That fiendish link, that fiendish influence, can be tapped and manipulated by other creatures. So even though your tiefling may have the best of intentions and follow the most noble path, they still innately, inherently, have a link to the fiendish planes, which is valuable to evil uh, other creatures um, and can be manipulated. So there's always that. And this is one of the main plots of the movie Hellboy, for instance. The fact that he's been raised by humans and... Uh, is struggling to he wants to be a part of human society but he is manipulated and he's seen as pivotal to an evil cult which is dedicated to around to bringing about the end of the world through summoning old ones um great cosmic powers so that can certainly be a storyline in your campaign if one of the player characters is playing a tiefling or if tieflings have become prominent in your storyline so yeah so from that point on uh, they, they, their descendants um, had devilish features horns, non-prehensile tails oh it does say they were non-prehensile um, sharpened teeth, red skin and uh, they were known forevermore as tieflings uh, in 5th edition the overlord of the Nine Hells Asmodeus is cited as the ancestral source of their devilish features however that, that's just one of the tiefling varieties that you could have you can have all sorts of tiefling varieties 
um, so they can have all sorts of like traits of the devil kind um, so some of them may even have insectoid features of like ice devils I don't see why not so the tiefling aspects um, there's a number of features that uh, that that can be referenced for the lineage um, yeah and uh, yeah oh the uh, the non prehensile tails are approximately four or five feet in length um, so they're actually quite difficult to disguise or conceal but they can be wrapped around the body um, it's not easy but it can be done uh, basically they just tuck it up um, behind themselves and then bring it forward and then wrap it around their waist um, and it can sort of be concealed quite well uh, but it's not comfortable really yeah so that's that's tieflings for you um, mm. uh, Pathfinder I, I, I guess I should give a shout out to Pathfinder in their uh, their setting uh, they also have tieflings and um, they're typically what does it say here blood calls nearly able to bleh. Even the spawn of the succubus, succubus can become a saint and a grandchild of a pit fiend and unsuspecting hero. Uh, so they basically have the same sort of aspect of um, they're fiendish, but they can actually be good. So tieflings in the material plane really create their own settlements and holdings. So, so essentially they're basically a carbon copy of tieflings um, in the Forgotten Realms. Um, they have a plus two racial bonus to um, their bluff and stealth checks. Uh, otherwise they're pretty much exactly the same they've got a plus two to dexterity plus two to an intelligence and minus two to charisma so hmm, that that um, speaks of the unnerving aspect of others when seeing their their physical appearance will give them a minus to their to their charisma yes yeah whatever um it sort of ignores the fact that they're they're quite beguiling so it says here beguiling liar many tieflings find it best to get their way through the world by telling others what they want to hear uh, they practice telling habitual falsehoods um, and that grants them their buff bluff check bonus and it also says that they're a fiendish sprinter and have feet that are more bestial than human which gives them a um, the ability to gain a 10 foot racial bonus to their speed when using a charge run or a withdraw action they have they could have a maw or a claw um, they could have a prehensile tail. They could have scaled skin. Uh, they could have a soul-searing ability. Rare tieflings have the peculiar sight that allows them to see the state of a creature's soul. And they can use the death watch as an at-will spell-like ability. So that's interesting. Um, and some of them have vestigial wings. And uh, it's listed that their flavored classes include alchemist, cleric, druid, inquisitor, magus, pal paladin, rogue, sorcerer, summoner, witch, and wizard so yeah pretty cool uh i don't generally um, delve into pathfinder though but i was just kind of curious in this particular case because it is a uh, a player character race and um it's quite interesting yeah anyway so that's it for uh tieflings on this particular uh chat um feel free to uh enrich them with uh, variant aspects variant backgrounds uh variant appearance uh, talk about who their actual ancestor is if you want to um, give that as an option to your play players uh, to sort of you know tell them who exactly are you descended from um, or perhaps leave it as a secret that they can discover um, yeah certainly I don't see why not and uh, have fun with them certainly and uh, let your player explore their, their fiendish nature at their will as long as it's not too disruptive um, and certainly keep in mind that constantly persecuting them in the game well every single person they, the npc that they come across um it could be a bit of a drag um so occasionally come up with people who have met tieflings before and are willing to give them the benefit of the doubt that can be refreshing right i'll catch you later everyone have a great weekend and i'll be speaking again with you soon don't forget if you haven't subscribed already please subscribe give me a like give me a comment down below i always reply to all comments thanks for watching everyone as an excellent addition to this video on tieflings, the Mighty Glue Stick channel recommends Pair of Geeks YouTube channel and their recent video on how to run a hustle game. A uh, recent subscriber to the Mighty Glue Stick channel says, Yeah, get the microphone under my face. Okay, thanks for listening everybody.